Welcome to another edition of Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237 Teamsters. With us once again, a very special guest is Bronx District Attorney Darcel Clark. She became the 13th attorney for the Bronx County in 2026. I mean, not 2026, <laughs> 2016. She is the first woman in that position and the first African-American woman to be elected to a district attorney in New York State. She was reelected to the second term in 2019. District Attorney Clark is also the co-chair of the Prosecutors Against Gun Violence and a board member of both the National District Attorneys Association and the District Attorneys Association of the State of New York. District Attorney Clark is a lifelong Bronx, New York resident, raised in public housing and educated in public, the public schools. She received a bachelor's degree in political science from Boston College, where she serves as a member of the Board of Trustees and earned her law degree at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Welcome back to Reaching Out, and thank you for coming back. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for having me. And one part of my bio that you didn't put down is that my father was a loyal member of Local 237. No, that's not in your bio, and I love it when you say it. Your father was a member of New York City Housing Authority, and when we first met, you you told me that, mm -hmm. and uh, I believe he was still alive when you told me that. No, no, oh? no, he wasn't, but he, wasn't. He, okay. he was loyal till the end to 237, I tell okay. you that. Every time he played Lotto, his numbers were 237. It was always in it, no wow. matter what. <laughs> Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was watching... Uh, a broadcast from Washington, D.C. The Mets were playing the Washington Nationals. Mm -hmm. Now, I, it reminded me of Washington, D.C. because you're Howard University and you're in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. So here's how it went. There was a gentleman there. He was being interviewed on New York radio. And he said, uh, I mean, New York uh, television. He said, you know, I have relatives in New York City. He said, okay. And he said, the relatives are, they live in Brooklyn. He said, okay, what part of Brooklyn? And the gentleman said, the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we all laughed. He said, okay, the Bronx. The, the Bronx part of Brooklyn. So, so that's, 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 that's just a funny story that came to mind. I said, you can't make that up. So, last year, your office focused on both victims of crime and deterrence of crime. How is the DA's office continuing to work with victims in the outreach efforts? Well, you know, the, the, the core part and values of a prosecutor's office is standing up for victims of crime. We do that each and every day because I am the one that Make sure that I can stand up for those who don't have a voice themselves. I, I'm I'm the people's lawyer. When we say for the people, you know, it's the DA's office that goes first. So we're here for victims no matter what. But we don't do this work at the expense of violating the rights of the accused because they are also the people. And today's, you know, victim could be tomorrow's defendant and back, you know, vice versa. But we are here for people that need help. I have a Crime Victims Assistance Bureau that works day in and day out, that does advocacy, that has therapy. We have uh, um, housing um, resources, you name it, whatever the victims are, and witnesses of crime need, we are able to provide here in-house. And if we can't, we connect them to the resources and services within the community to make sure that they have what they need to be safe. DA's job, number one, is public safety, and public safety for victims of crime is part of that priority. So we continue to do that work every day. What, what are some of the resources you have to uh, accomplish this mission? Well, we have, like, like I said, we start off with, um, you know, we've seen an uptick in crime in the Bronx. So, you know, I, I started something new last year. I have some crime um, advocates response team where... When a crime happens, 
we send advocates out to the scenes of crime, to, to, the, uh, to the homes of victims, to the hospitals. Within the first 24 to 48 hours, we try to connect with them to, to provide services and see what they need for their trauma, whatever safety measures they need. We do that. People don't always trust the police, but they should know that they can trust the DA's office because as we um, investigate crimes, they still need to be tended to whether somebody was apprehended or not. So that, that violent um, crime response team is key. Actually, I just went out to Lincoln Hospital two nights ago. An uh, eight-year-old boy was uh, an innocent bystander of a shooting. And there I was at Lincoln Hospital 8 p.m. with my crime victims response uh, member to make sure that we connected with that little boy, with his mother, his grandmother, and family, to make sure that we start the process of giving them what they need. If that means relocation services, moving them, if we can, uh, making sure they have therapy, uh, you know, transportation, whatever it is, if we can provide it, that's what we do. Yeah, that 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 uh, little boy got off his school bus. He yeah. was shot in the thigh yeah. by a, a stray bullet. And yeah. I think the report was two individuals were having a gunfight. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And what a brave little young man he was, too, to see him there. But no kid should have to ever experience anything like that. I mean, I was happy to be there for him. But who wants their child to meet the district attorney in that way? You know, there's so many ways that people can meet the DAs and some good, some bad. But that's a situation where that that kid was there with his grandmother and he was worried about his grandmother and his grandmother's worried about him. And I'm there worried about both of them because it's my job to make sure that they stay safe. So we're providing services to them to make sure that they're going to be all right. Yes. Uh, just part of uh, part of what's going on in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, due to the surge in youth crime. You hosted a youth summit to listen to the Bronx youth and community partners about what they're experiencing and how they're uh, seeing how they're being seen on the streets. Uh, can you tell us what did you learn? That summit was so powerful to me. We had over 150 kids there on a horrible rainy day in the spring, but they stayed for the entire time, and we really got to see what they were thinking. And more importantly, to listen to them, to hear what it is that they need and what they thought about the, the perception of young people, you know, in today's world. And, and it was just so enlightening to get a chance to meet them, for them to get a chance to actually talk to me. They questioned me. And I mean, they really asked me, you know, some real questions about the work that I'm doing but most importantly, the work that I'm trying to do on their behalf. Because one thing that I wanted to communicate to them is that the DA's office job is not just prosecution. My job is prevention. My job is intervention. Of course, it's prosecution as well as re-entry. It's like a holistic approach that I'm doing in this office. And having that youth summit was part of the prevention measures that my office is doing because in order to make sure that we set up policies that are going to work, that are going to impact our community, you got to speak to the members of the community. In order for me to come up with policies on how to handle youth crime, I need to speak to the people who are the youth. So many times I'm in rooms where there's a whole bunch of adults and they're saying, what are you doing? You got to do more for our kids. Our kids need this. Our kids need that. And in the room, never any young people. So I decided to call my own meeting with the young people, which was the summit, to really hear what they said. And, you know, it was it was very interesting to hear what their thoughts are on their music, on how they're perceived, on social media, on, on, on their hopes and their dreams and their aspirations. That's what I wanted to hear, because when I sat down with them, I said, this is what I want to say to you. I'm the Bronx District Attorney. I have a lot of resources. This is New York City. We're one of the, the most resource cities in the world. You tell me what I need to do to keep you from picking up a gun, or if you've already picked up a gun, how to make sure that you never do it again, to make sure that you get what you need to be successful so that you could be that aspiring you know, artist, teacher, lawyer, doctor, whatever it is you want to be, you tell me what I need to bring to you 
and I will get it done. If I can't do it myself, I will get the resources to do that. And it was important for them to hear that somebody really wanted to be invested in them. And, and that's the message I wanted to leave with them. And from that, we had a sign up because I'm now starting a youth council that's going to work out of my office so I can have young people at my fingertips who are invested in their community and making sure that they have what they need so that they can remain healthy and safe in their communities. And starting this fall, we'll be kicking that up based on the, the, the recommendations that we received from them at the Youth Summit. So it was very powerful and very necessary. And I'm really yep. happy and pleased with it. So uh, tell us some of the things they told you when you say, what do you want to inspire? What do you want from the district attorney's office? What's happening? What was some of the uh, responses you got from them? Well, some of the things was that they needed more things in their community. You know, some of them, uh, um, they can't step out of their block because of the fear of, you know, being um, shot or, 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 or attacked or whatever. So they want to move throughout the city, but e even in situations where they can't, we need to bring resources to where they are. It was about, they said, why don't you meet us where we are? Why do I have to travel all the way across town to try? Why do those people across town have the services and I don't have that in my community? So we start identifying those gaps in places where they don't have the services for us to bring it in so they could do it and, and be safe in their own community and still get the resources and support that they need. So, you know, we're doing that. I mean, you know, there are a lot of them that are, um, you know, housing is an issue, affordable housing, families not being uh, stabilized. You know, so many kids we know, you know, couch surfing, going from one friend's house to relative's house to the next to the next. We need to help them be stabilized in areas like that. Some of them, they want jobs. You know, we ask a lot of, of, of people in our community, oh, volunteer, whatever. Some people would love to volunteer, but you know what? They can't afford it. So they talked about, I'll do the volunteerism, but can you give me a little stipend or something to help me out? The car fare to get back and forth to the place I'm volunteering or just a little money so that I'll be able to eat and be able to come. Because those are the choices that they have to make every day. Kids shouldn't have to make choices like that. We should be able to provide that for them. So those were some of the things. So we're talking about finding jobs now for them. Not all of them are going to go to college. Not all of them want to go to college. Talking about, you know, for example, labor plays a big role in that apprenticeship that unions have that can get that lead to the to, to a meaningful middle class, giving people trade skills so that they can use that and build on that. So bringing those kind of resources to our young people and more importantly, to open their minds to those possibilities because they simply don't know what they don't know. So therefore, we try to, you know, we're going to use all of those kind of tools with our youth council, as well as our relationships with community-based organizations and being in the community to make sure that the kids know that there's hope for them. That, that's that's um, really a powerful presentation that they made to you. You can't afford to volunteer because you don't have lunch money, you don't have transportation money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. That's the least that we could do for them. Give them lunch and transportation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then give them credit for for volunteering. That's powerful. Uh, you've been listening to Reaching Out, Gregory Floyd. I'm President of Local 237, and we're talking to the Bronx District Attorney, and we're talking about uh, the Bronx and how the District Attorney's office is handling crime and the community. Uh, your office started the BOGAP program. Mm -hmm. Tell us first what BOGAP means and then tell us about the program. Okay, so the, uh, it's BOGAP. We're working with the Osborne Association. I, I think you might be familiar with them. They're a justice uh, impact uh, uh, service organization. So it's the Bronx Osborne Gun um Prevention and Accountability Program. Okay. Um, so BOGAP Bronx, Osborne, okay, I'm gonna mention Gun Accountability Project. So, okay. Okay, so what it is is this. We see a lot of cases where people are caught with guns. Guns is a big problem in the Bronx and I am strict on guns. It's like, 
You you have a gun, it can't be for a good reason. And if as long as you're carrying a gun illegally, to me, what I've seen in my experience is you're either going to end up being shot or shooting somebody. Neither one is a good outcome. So I wanted to come up with an alternative to incarceration, even for guns. Because the man, there's a mandatory minimum for guns, which is three and a half years in state prison. That's the minimum you get if you're convicted of a crime. And so when I was handling guns at first, you know, I said, look, I got to hold people accountable that's carrying illegal guns, no matter what. So if the state, if the minimum is three and a half years, I made it my policy that if they avoided a trial and admitted their guilt, that I would let, allow them to plead guilty to it and get two years in jail with two years post-release supervision, which is like parole. You know, and, and a lot of people were taking it because I took a year and a half off of the mandatory minimum. They could get more than that, but that was the minimum, right? But then I started looking at the cases that we we're getting. And a lot of times it were first time gun offenders. They didn't use, they didn't try to use the gun at all, but they were simply carrying it. I said, well, let's peel back the onion even more. Why do these people feel like they need to carry guns? And when you started listening to them, you found out they live in neighborhoods where there's a lot of gang activity or a lot of violence, and they feel like they need it for protection. Some of them have been victims of gun violence themselves and say, look, I got to carry one because the other people have one. Some people have lost family members because of it, and they felt like they needed protection. And, and you know, so there were so many different reasons on why. So I said, again, we need to deal with the root causes of why people are getting, doing that in the first place. So I decided that instead of the two years in jail, two years post-release supervision, if I could pick a group of individuals that I'm willing to take the chance to give them a second chance as far as being gun offenders, that maybe we could make a difference in the community, save lives, and make people part of the solution rather than the problem. So I reached out to the Osborne Association. It took us three years to formulate this program. But what it is is this. We're taking first-time gun offenders, the ages of um, 17 to, to 24, um, and even extended it even out to 30 for some of them, because we see that there, there may have been more people that fit that category, and put them through an intensive 12-month program where they got job training, education, make sure they got housing, health insurance, mental health, um, substance use disorder, train um, counseling, all of those things, whatever their needs were, dealing with the root causes of what got them there, to give them that training, de-escalation skills, all kinds of things for them to be able to be better people when they came out. And if they successfully completed the program, they have to plead guilty to the gun, they complete the program 12 months, and when they finish, if they come out with a job or they're reconnected to school and they stabilize or whatever. We take away that felony plea, make it a misdemeanor, and then they could go on with their lives. During And, and it was a pilot program because, again, it's risky because you're talking about people that are carrying guns. And I'm not sure I should be giving them a second chance, but I'm investing in my community and in these young black and brown people and mostly men that we were going to do. We had 25 individuals, right? During that time, um, uh, like 20 of them have graduated since then. During the first year that we did it, three of them became fathers while they were in the program. And instead of them being visited by their family in state prison, they're now at home taking the care of their families, going to school, working, et cetera. That to me is a success story. That's the type of story that I want people to hear. And now instead of them being part of the problem that we have in the Bronx of people carrying guns, now they're part of the solution. Some of them even became peer mentors in the Osborne Association to deal with others who end up coming through the same program. We've increased it now. The Fortune Society has also joined on board and we're looking for funding in order to increase it. So we're measuring how successful we are. We're keeping track of these young people to make sure they stay connected. But it really is an alternative to what could be a minimum of three and a half years of state prison to now a young man working and taking care of their families. Okay. Your office also hosted a re-entry fair. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the re-entry fair uh, 
and um, who who attended, how many attended, and what it accomplished. Well, we've we've hosted several reentry fairs over the last couple of years. Um, we actually have one in another two weeks that we're bringing um, to the uh, Northeast Bronx, the East Chester uh, Gardens um, community. And uh, what, what we're doing now, we've held big ones here right at the office. We have one at Hostos College, and we connect with a lot of you know service organizations to be there where all kinds of organizations are there tabling so people who are returning back to the Bronx can go and, and get the help that they need. Look, people would think that the DA wouldn't be involved in re-entry because, you know, my job is prosecuting people and I'm responsible probably for people being convicted and then coming back to the communities where they come from. And I understand that as a DA, they may have served their time, but they eventually have to return back to their communities, which means back to the Bronx. I want to make sure that they're stabilized when they leave jail so that they don't come back into the community and reoffend. So if we could get them a job, we could get them education, we could get them the housing that they need, we could get them the mental health resources that they need, health care, you know, mental health, you know, whatever it is that they need that we could provide and connect them to the services it makes them that much better to be successful in the community. So we've had a number of those. We're having another one September 26th. But this time, we're not going to have these global ones anymore. I'm going to start bringing them to individual communities so they don't even have to travel. They could be right there in their local neighborhoods where they could do it. And again, the same thing, service providers will be there to get them the help that they need. A new class of uh, assistant district attorneys is starting in, um, in the Bronx. What is the advice that you would give to a new assistant district attorney? Well, first of all, we started 40 new assistants and they've come from various backgrounds, you know, very diverse class, um, come from a, all parts of the country, different law schools. So I'm proud to have another 40 assistants. Uh, you know, we, we, we lost a lot of people um, coming out of COVID, people, you know, decided they didn't want to do this kind of work. What I've said to them is this, this is a challenging job. This is not for the faint of heart, okay? This is a job that's about service and sacrifice and not about self. So they are coming here because they want to help the people of the Bronx. My name may be on the door. I may be responsible for them getting their paycheck, but they don't work for me. We all work for the people of the Bronx. So that's the first thing that I tell them, that they're here for these people that live in this community every day. And the other thing I tell them is this, we're here on 161st Street, we're in the belly of the beast. Some other offices, they have nice plush offices and nice cafes and restaurants. And, and you know, it's a beautiful splendor of a particular city that right here in the Bronx DA's office, they're working right within the same community that we're serving. So Miss Mary that lives across the street in Concourse Village, we're here for her, her case, she may be a victim. She may be a defendant. We see everyone as we come to work every day. They ride the train next to a defendant or a witness or a police officer or a judge or a lawyer or a defense attorney. So they need to know that this is the reality of the work that we do every day and, and that we serve the people of the Bronx. So although they may not make the highest salary in the world, this is one of the most rewarding jobs they'll ever have. When we can help that domestic violence victim get away from her abuser, when we can help a child that's being uh, uh, abused or taken advantage of by a coach or a teacher, if we um, are exonerating somebody that we found out was wrongfully convicted and we right that wrong and learn from those mistakes, when we do that kind of work, this is why the work that we do, that's the reward that they get from doing this kind of work. So that's what I've told them. They're excited. I'm excited to have them here and they're ready to roll up their sleeves and get the work done on behalf of the people of the Bronx. Uh, I wish you and them a lot of success on doing the work for the people of the county, Bronx County. And okay. unfortunately for us, that's all the time we have for this segment of Reaching Out. Once again, you're welcome to come back anytime you want to. Thank you. Don't Thank need an invitation. Just pick up the phone and say, look, I have something to say, and I want to say it on reaching out. And we'll be glad Thank to you. have you. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate the opportunity always. Thank you. You be well. You've been listening to Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237 Teamsters. 
A very special guest once again was Bronx District Attorney Darcel Clark. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.